Hey guys, Joel Breidenball here. And as you can tell from the map behind me, I love to travel. One of the places I love to return to is Israel. And I want to invite you to be a part of the next trip to Israel in March of 2022. We're going to get a chance to visit Petra briefly, as well as the southern, central, and northern parts of Israel as we see the Red Sea, the Dead Sea, the Med Sea, and the Sea of Galilee. We'll see where Jesus ministered all around that region of the Sea of Galilee, where he was raised in Nazareth. Megiddo and where the Battle of Armageddon takes place. We're going to see the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem and Jerusalem where he ministered to many and where millions of people have gathered over the years. Thousands of years worshiped the Lord there. There's going to be all those things and so much more on this trip and I hope you can join me. If you have further questions you can check out the website or you can reach out to me and I hope you're able to join us and help spread the word. It's going to be a trip of a lifetime. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you this morning. We're going to ask that you go ahead and stand up with us. And if you are joining us online, we welcome you as well. And we're going to start out with Open the Eyes of My Heart.
compares to that promise. And this last song we're going to sing, um, it's called I Will Rise. And uh, this is one of our favorites. Um, but it says, you know, there's a day that's drawing near when the darkness breaks to light, the shadows disappear, and my faith shall be my eyes. And that is just going to be an amazing day. So if, join with us as we sing I Will Rise. Yeah. 
Well, did you guys get that? I will rise when he calls my name. We can go home after that, can't we? All right, that's what we're here for. All right, we have a prayer request this morning. Jeff Baker's mom has some serious health issues, so we want to pray for her. Uh, <clears throat> we have the Extraordinary Women's Conference, October 15 and 16. You can sign up out on the table. The church is covering the admission, the hotel, and the lunch. We have Anniversary Sunday, September 12th. There's a sign-up sheet back there so they know how many to prepare for. We have communion next Sunday night, so put that on your schedule next Sunday night. Uh, Dawn surgery is Friday, so please remember that. Remember to pray for her. Uh, in the bulletin, how many people here like to serve in some capacity? My goodness. All right, that explains a lot. There are a lot. There are a lot of opportunities to serve at church. It's in the bulletin. So please read that and pray because everybody here has something they can do to help our church family. Next Sunday night, sep nope, not next, September 12th, there is a baptism service. So that's something to come and be excited about, right? Okay, all right. Let's pray this morning so I can get off this stage. Lord, we thank you that we can come to church and, and we can serve in a free country. Help us to always remember that, 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 Lord, although there's a lot of oppression all over the world, Lord, that we're able to, to serve you freely. Help us to never take that for granted. Help us to realize what an opportunity that is and help us to, to understand, Lord, that when we get to heaven, we want to serve you while we're here on earth, that, Lord, we can stand before you and and, Lord, you'll greet us and, and thank us for our service on this earth in your name. I pray as a church, Lord, we'd be found worthy. I pray as individuals, Lord, in our own personal walk each day, the people we come in contact with, that we would live different than the rest of the world, that people would look at us and realize we have something they don't. Lord, I thank you for that last song that says you're going to call her name and we'll rise. Lord, that's what the Christian life is about. But help us to realize until that time there's a lot to do here. We pray, Lord, that we would all have pure hearts before you. We pray that we would do your will while we have breath. And, Lord, uh, the folks on this list, we know Don's surgery and Jeff's mom. Lord, we know that those people are going through a trial. But, Lord, I know you're able. I know that you're in the business of meeting your people's needs. I thank you that you're already working on that behalf, uh, Lord. And, and for the, the conferences coming up and the baptism, Lord, we just... We thank you for that. We thank you that people are getting together. And, and even though our world tells us that all of that's failing, we know it's not. Lord, I pray that the word go out this morning clear and concise, that hearts would be changed and leave different than they came in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, <clears throat> the mission moment for today is Romy K. Capulli, and this is a picture she sent me um, when they had finally gotten back over to the Philippines, and uh, she had put at the end of it Psalm 91. So I'm going to start out by reading Psalm 91, and then I'll give you an update. Um, the one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. I say to the Lord, refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He himself will deliver you from the hunter's net, from the destructive plague. He will cover you with his feathers. You will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be, will be a protective shield. You will not fear the terror of the night, the arrow that flies by day, the plague that stalks in darkness, or the pestilence that ravages at noon. Though a thousand fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, the pestilence will not reach you. You will only see it with your eyes and witness the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord my refuge, the Most High, your dwelling place, no harm will come to you. No plague will come near your tent. For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread 
on the lion and the cobra, you will trample the young lion and the serpent. Because he is lovingly devoted to me, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls out to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and give him honor. I will satisfy him with a long life and show him my salvation. The Kapulis are crossover mission, the basketball mission, and they are back in the Philippines. I'm just going to read to you what uh, they sent to me in August. Um, we are finally, uh, this was before they were actually in the Philippines, we are finally, uh, we are good to go back to Piñas, all checked in, waiting to get on board, uh, and leaving at 11 p.m. We are thankful for the two extra months of no lockdown when they were here. Of course, I don't know if you all remember, they visited here. Um, the Lord gifted us with being given the two uh, doses of the COVID vaccine. Now he leads us back with high COVID cases, lockdown, and turmoil in the country with typhoons and the coming election. We know he has a great deal of purpose in his hands and of protection will be upon us. We will be in quarantine for 10 days in the hotel required by the government. This is the picture that they sent me, what they had to wear. We thank him for providing the expense through a generous friend and partner. The Lord never fails. He is always faithful. Uh, we treasure your prayers for us. We love you all so much. Thank you for your love, friendship, partnership. You do. You are dear to us. You all at Faith Baptist are always in our prayers. May the Lord use you even more through all your endeavors in making an impact for Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Angie, for that great update. So today, as we sing this song and, and picture... Sorrow and love mingled, flowing down. Uh, I think it, uh, let, let's just be motivated to put all differences aside in the body and to, as Paul said, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So let's, uh, let's do that as we sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. <laughs> When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches Sorrow meet 
Please be seated. Let's talk about the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. In a matter of just weeks, 20 years of history have been reversed at a speed no one predicted. Wow. I mean, to see the Taliban, and these are actually fighting Taliban, they're not Taliban leadership, they're in the presidential palace, sitting in the president's desk. These are amazing scenes. So how did we wind up here? And what does it mean for Afghanistan and the people there? Let's start with what triggered the Taliban offensive. It's time to end the forever war. Back in April, President Biden announced he was pulling U.S. troops out of Afghanistan in line with a deal that Trump struck last year. Other NATO countries, like the U.K., said they'd follow. In May, troops had already started pulling out. And by July, the Americans abandoned Bagram Air Base, their main hub for military operations. They packed up in the middle of the night without telling their Afghan counterparts who were left behind to run the place. At that point, the Taliban accelerated their offensive. In some places, Afghan security forces put up a fight, but elsewhere, they just crumbled. And remember, these were the forces that the US trained and equipped to the tune of $80 billion. And they outnumbered Taliban fighters four to one. This really was a snowballing psychologically and militarily where uh, initial successes by the Taliban combined with the sense that there wasn't really a good strategy that had been developed by the United States and NATO and Afghanistan before we pulled out. All that together meant that many Afghan soldiers and police and many politicians and warlords and militia leaders, you know, you name it, decided it was better to submit and ask for amnesty or forgiveness rather than fight. On August 6th, the Taliban took their first provincial capital. After that, the other capitals fell like dominoes. Places like Kunduz, Ghazni, and Lashkargah. Within a week, the Taliban had taken Afghanistan's second and third biggest cities, Kandahar and Herat. Then they kept moving towards the capital. Once they took the city of Jalalabad on August 15th, they basically surrounded Kabul. Taliban fighters surround the capital, Kabul, and negotiations are underway to secure a transfer of power. That evening, those Taliban fighters were inside the presidential palace. It capped off a crazy day when things were changing by the hour. People were panicking, people were trying to get into cars. They were, they were trying to get their money out of the banks. They were trying to go to visa services offices. I saw people buying luggage. It just seemed like people were trying to figure out what to do. The US military scrambled to evacuate staff from the American embassy. By the afternoon, President Ashraf Ghani had left the country. And then there was a mad rush for flights out. The airport road was like completely full of cars, lots of armored vehicles, lots of vehicles with government plates, people of means, people of power. But a lot of others were basically looking to flee. The situation got even more chaotic the next day. Commercial flights were suspended, and we saw desperate scenes like this. You saw people climbing on the tires of planes, even they, as, they were, as they were taking off. And then at least one man appearing to fall to his death. For most Afghans, leaving isn't an option. They're stuck wondering what life will be like under the Taliban a second time around. Before the US invasion in 2001, the Taliban were in power for five years and imposed their brutal interpretation of Islamic law. Music was forbidden, girls were banned from going to school, men and women were stoned to death for adultery. Is this where Afghanistan is headed again? Well, a Taliban spokesman offered reassurances. He said the group is committed to a peaceful transfer of power, that it would offer amnesty to government officials, and that women's rights would be respected. The Islamic Emirate is committed to the rights of women within the framework of Sharia. In some ways, it's really different from what we, we were told it was like in 1996. They're trying to be very accommodating. But can they be trusted? Many Afghans are skeptical. They don't see women as their equal or even like, you know, a second class citizen. They see them as commodity, as possessions. So expecting them that they have changed and they will let women talk or do anything 
far beyond uh, comprehension. They want to reimpose their old version of their Imarat, which would result in l severe uh, restrictions of most of the gains of the past 20 years. The life people have come to expect. And that life just got really tough. Food prices are through the roof, people are struggling to get hold of basic supplies, and people can't get their money out of banks. There are also thousands of Afghans who fled as the Taliban swept through the country. Many have ended up in makeshift camps in Kabul, adding to the 400,000 Afghans who were forced to leave their homes since the beginning of the year. What's going to happen to all of them? People are still trying to make sense of what happened, and the blame game has ramped up, including from the White House. Afghanistan political leaders gave up and fled the country. The Afghan military collapsed, sometime without trying to fight. We trained and equipped an Afghan military force of some 300,000 strong. We gave them every chance to determine their own future. What we could not provide them was the will to fight for that future. I would not call this a case of intelligence failure. I would call it a policy failure. It was President Biden who pretty much knew the risks he was running. Now, yes, we've been surprised at the pace, but he knew full well that this kind of outcome was within the realm of possibility, if not probability, when he made the decision. I didn't vote for Joe Biden to protect me. I voted for Ashraf Ghani. He should have been protecting me. He should be controlling uh, the corrupt leaders within the country. What did he do? He didn't do anything. He abandoned us. He left us, right? So I'm, I'm more curious at my own leaders rather than the leaders in the West. The focus is now on what the new Taliban government will look like. Who is the government? Who is the mayor of Kabul right now? Who is the governor of Kabul right now? Who is it going to be in charge? And what is that structure going to look like? International negotiators in Doha are trying to answer some of those questions and salvage something from years of peace talks. They're encouraging the Taliban to set up a government that in some way represents different parts of Afghan society. And the Taliban may be open to that as a way to secure a semblance of international legitimacy. But at the same time, their fighters are in the presidential palace and patrolling the streets armed to the teeth. So it's absolutely clear who's calling the shots. If you want some more background, check out our recent episode, Who Are the Taliban? And subscribe to Al Jazeera English so you don't miss our next episodes. We've got. Y'all hear me okay? A little bit of context from my own personal perspective about this. In September 1st, 2001, or September 11th, 2001, uh, we officially decided as a nation we needed to do something in Afghanistan. Uh, not only because of the danger that it presented to the United States, uh, but also because of the hurt and harm that was being done in that nation to their own people. And I was actually active duty in the military during that time. Uh, I have made three combat deployments in support of Operation Enduring Freedom total of 22 months of my life, birthdays, Christmases, holidays, special occasions, out at sea in the heat of the Persian Gulf. For eight straight months, the coolest place that I was able to go was 104 degrees. My daughter is 22. Most of her grown-up life, she knew me being gone in the military trying to get the freedom.
got an email from the Office of Naval Intelligence reminding me as a retiree that I'm not allowed to make comments that might be derogatory toward current leadership. There are simply not words that can bring back meaning to that time. That has been lost. And this whole week, as I was trying to prepare this sermon from Corinthians, this could not escape my mind. Not only for my own loss, but for what these people who we have fought so hard for have, have completely lost. Gutted. And I know what my mind tells me I should think and how I should respond to this. See, the, the word of the Lord says that the, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponent with gentleness, that God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. This is how we are supposed to respond. But the question is, how do we do that? How do we get to that point where we can Respond as the servant of the Lord, patiently, kindly, teaching, enduring all evil, that they may come to their senses. Reflecting on this has not been easy for me. I have skin in the game. Real blood, real tears, real lost loved ones. And I don't say that for your acclaim, I don't say that for your praise. I don't say that for your disdain, if you have disdain for military members. I want you to understand the context of who is speaking to you. And what I understand our marching orders from God to be regarding how we need to respond in this crisis. See, it's entirely appropriate for governments to act with the power of the sword that is military response, that is to promote good and punish evil. This is the role of government. This was ordained by God all the way back in Genesis after Noah got out of the ark. He said to Noah, as for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. And then he says, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. God so embodied humanity with value that any person who would dare take the life of another human being was responsible to pay that back with their own blood, with their own life. But this is a sword that is given to the government. Paul reminded us in Romans, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. I am gutted to the core by what I have seen. I can't think about it for too long, because it will just, I mean, 23 years of my life, the sacrifice is just gone. Yet the word of the Lord says that that authority has existence and has been instituted by God. Whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. Those who resist will incur judgment from God. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. Not what the government wants, notice. It says do what is good. Do what is righteous to God. The government is his servant for our good. 
But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He's the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. We have to put in context this power of the sword was intended by God for government to use for our good. Sometimes the good that we need is God using government to enact judgment on us as sinful people. Sometimes when we have gone so far from the the moral values that are described in Scripture as being normative from humanity, God turns over the government as that force that carries the power of the sword. And we're still meant to obey as far as it follows the word of the Lord. And so when we see things like this happen in a country like Afghanistan, our response is to want to do something with the power of the sword. To take as the church the mission that God gave to government because we see government not doing it well. This has happened in history. You remember the attempt by the church in the Middle Ages to go into Jerusalem and recover the Holy Land from the Muslim community. They went on these crusades three times. That was the Christian church acting out of character and against what God has given the mission of the church to be. We, as God's kingdom, do not carry the power of the sword. Now, if you serve in the military, law enforcement, even the Coast Guard, if you want to count that as military, Space Force, I guess, is the new thing. You know, God doesn't say that that's a bad profession. When the centurion came up to Jesus, Jesus didn't tell him, get out of the military, that's wrong. You are acting as an agent of the state. You are allowed to use the power of the sword in that respect. But that is not the way the mission of God's people gets carried forward. So how do we look at and how do we put meaning, how do we understand things like this that happened after so much time so much money, so much bloodshed, so much sacrifice. How do we as God's people move forward and deal with that? Knowing we have not been given the power of the sword. See, when the church takes the power of the sword, they get rebuked by God. Simon Peter, when Judas betrayed Jesus, saw the centurions coming up to take Jesus away, and Peter grabbed the sword, he drew it, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. That dude's name was Malchus. And Jesus' words to him were, put your sword into its sheath. The anger and outrage that you think you should turn into the using the power of the sword, you need to take your sword and put it back into its sheath. Shall I not, Jesus says, drink the cup that the Father has given to me? Those of you who've been with us on the Daniel study know one of the main lessons that is is repeated throughout is the sovereignty of God. And whenever we put our hope and faith and trust in the power of man and the power of government to do the purposes of God, we're putting our hope on an institution that cannot carry that out. Church does not have the power of the sword. Christ declares who's going to be an authority. We remember that the angel came down and revealed to Nebuchadnezzar that he was going to lose his mind for seven years. And the angel said, I have declared these things, or these things have been declared so that all of mankind may know that God in heaven puts on the throne who he wants and takes down who he wants. And it was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, at the feast where the handwriting on the wall, the charge against him was not his immoral lifestyle. The charge against him was not the blasphemy and the idolatry. The charge against him was you knew full well that it was God who put men on thrones and took them down, and you did not honor me as God, and so I'm taking you out. Many, many shekelu farsim. 
You've been weighed. You came up short. The end is now. The New Testament also says, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We like to think that as a nation who can develop bunker buster bombs and mothers of all bombs that we have somehow harnessed real power. God says, nay, nay, moose breath. You don't know what it's like to be the judge of all, to enact vengeance. God says, that's mine. Jesus himself walking said, Don't fear man who can only kill the body, but fear God who can kill the body and the soul. What happened there has victims and it has people who perpetrated evil. The power of the sword and the government to punish the wicked is given by God. It's not given to the church. Our responsibility is to convert the heart of the wicked so that they won't face eternal judgment. Because for as evil and wicked as the things that they're doing right now to their victims on earth, it's nothing compared to what awaits them apart from being in Christ for eternal judgment. It's nothing. Immaterial. Our life is but a vapor, prophet Isaiah says. Vengeance is given to the government for punishing evil. Luke says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. What? No way. He repeats at the end of that, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. At a time like this, when the the meaning of what and the consequences of what has been done for so long seem to be without any value, no substance, just a vapor gone. How do you look at somebody as a perpetrator of evil and love them? How can we live this lifestyle? Be merciful, he continues, even as your father is merciful. How how can we do this? How how can we live this way? And this is what I reflected on this week. This is what I couldn't get out of my mind, is I know what I'm commanded to do as a servant of the Lord. I'm to be not quarrelsome. I'm to be kind to everyone. I'm supposed to be able to teach, to be patient in enduring evil. How can I do this, Lord? How can I correct my opponents with gentleness? so that God might grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, that they might come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. Notice the perspective Paul gives to Timothy. These people are acting that way because they are prisoners of war to Satan. The ones who are perpetrating this evil are in fact themselves the ones who are ensnared by Satan, captured by him to do his will. How do you get your heart to move to that direction? And, and I came up with six things that, that I know make a difference to me. And the first of these six is that we must know what our marching orders are from God. 
Seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your Lord. What was the commission God gave to his church? Was it to go into all the world and tramp out the enemies of evil? Did God say to his disciples, now all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. So go, therefore, and put to death all those who are persecuting others. Was that it? I mean, that feels good. That's what we want to do. We want to go up to that bully in the schoolyard and punch him right in the face, give him a taste of his own medicine, right? I mean, I do. That's not what our duty is. This isn't what God has commissioned us to do. It's not what he's empowered us to do. Jesus came to the disciples after being resurrected, and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We aren't getting our marching orders from a second lieutenant or, you know, some some low-ranking angel being. We're getting it from God himself who the Father has given to the Son all authority on heaven and earth. And because of that authority, we are given this charge. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, Emmanuel, to the end of the age. It is frustrating to see failure When you aren't following the orders that you've been given, whatever you accomplish is going to fail. You see, because we got our orders from the one to whom all authority on heaven and earth has been given. So if you're doing something different than that, you can expect to not succeed in that and be frustrated by it. Second thing, we need to know who our enemy is. See, Paul lived under the rule of Roman emperors who did things like um, have their mother put to death. She went to go out to sea, and the emperor had rigged a giant lead plate above the bed in the ship she was going to be on and had a soldier cut the straps that were holding the giant lead plate, crushed his own mom. Paul lived under a Roman emperor who kicked to death his pregnant wife. Tried to get his horse put on the Senate. Was married to two different men, once, or boys I should say, once as the husband and once as the wife. The one he made his wife he had made into a eunuch for the wedding night. These were the people Paul had as his rulers. And who did Paul say was his enemy? Who did Paul look to and say, these are the people that are opposing me and the mission of God? Was it the emperor? Was it the soldiers that carried out the emperor's will? Nope. In the letter to the Ephesians, he says, you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Talking about people who act that way, they follow the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Paul knew where the source of it was. He said the source of it is, isn't, isn't that person. That person is acting as a prisoner. He continued in Ephesians, he says, among whom we, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul says they're acting that way because they are children of the devil. Their very nature is wrathful. And he reminds us, you and I used to be just like that. We used to have that very same nature inside of us. Talking about overcoming this, he says, Be strong in the Lord and put this in and in the strength of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It sure feels like it. it. says, but the truth is you fight against the rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. If you go to war against the people who are carrying out the desires of their carnal flesh, if you go to war against the pr- people who are the prisoners of the prince of the power of the air, you're fighting the wrong enemy. You've got your sights set too low or too high, I guess. First John reads, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. See, John isn't thinking about this mortal life walking around that somehow you're going to overcome every evil that's in this world. He says the the real battle is a spiritual battle against the spirits of the Antichrist. And you've already won that battle if you are in Christ. And as the victor, go out and do the job that we have actually been given to do as the church. As the one who has already overcome the world, quit setting your sights so low on fighting against just the people. That's not where the real battle is. And don't fight with the weapons of fleshly, carnal beings. We have to know, as God's warriors, what our weapons really are. And that is the Word of God. We see this in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. For though we walk in the flesh... Right? We just preached about this. We are not waging war according to the flesh. The weapons are, of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strong, the ideas, the principles, the philosophy that drives the wickedness that caused this overflow or overthrow of power in Afghanistan. That idea can and will be overthrown by the word of God. That's okay to say amen, it's true. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Do you know why we have to do that? Because we're still walking in the flesh, right? And we still look at things like this and we still get hurt and we still want to lash out in our pain about what happened, but all continues. He says, the word of God is living, or the author of Hebrews, the the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. See, one of the campaign efforts that was made in warfare was the shock and awe. You guys remember that? Remember what the point of that was? It was to so dishearten the enemy, like what happened with the the nuclear bombs dropped on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The point was to so dishearten the enemy that they thought there's no way we can possibly win, and so we'll just give up. The author of Hebrews says, that's cute. You've got a weapon that's so sharp it can divide, not just between bone and marrow, but between soul and spirit, and it can discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You're not just impressing with the eyes. He goes on, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You want to dress down the enemy? Lay them bare before the word of God and the idea that they hold on to is going to fall 
apart. Because the one who's in you is greater than the one that's in the world. And the victory has already been won. Paul concludes his section on spiritual warfare by reminding us to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And fourth, what do we do to make sure that our mind and our heart is on the right thing besides knowing our mission, besides knowing that our enemy is not the people? The people are not the enemy. The people are the mission field. Whether they're the victim or the one perpetrating the, the evil. Whether you're a refugee or a Taliban fighter, they are both the mission field. Know your enemy. Know your weapons. And finally, know your king. See, for those 23 years that I was in the military, I saw what I thought was progress going on. I thought what I was doing was making a difference in that it was going to matter in the end. I thought that the people who lived in Afghanistan who could send their daughters to school to learn to read and do math and actually get a job, that that was going to continue. I thought people would someday be able to walk around the streets of Afghanistan without having to be worried about getting blown up by an improvised explosive device. But you put your trust in the wrong thing, and the result is not good. But we have a hope and a king who has written the book. And you know how the book ends? Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems, and his name, the one that no one knows but himself, He's clothed in a robe that's dipped in blood, and the name by which he's called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, and white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe, on his thigh. Whoop. On his robe and on his thigh has a name written, King of kings and lords of lords. Two things about this. One, yes, our victory is secure. Two, those who don't know the name of God, their fate is sealed to be pressed out like the winepress of the wrath of God. We have been commissioned by God to take people who are in that second group and move them into the first, having white robes following behind the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is not a vain hope. This is not something that depends on how hard you work or how much you believe. This end is coming. There is no stopping it. There is no power in heaven or on earth or below the earth that's going to change the way this ends. But we have been given a mission, a job from God. So how do we, how do we carry this out? How do we get to where our heart can follow after the Lord and, and do what he has commissioned us to do. The first thing is we need to take a look at where we are weak. We spend a whole lot of time, I've seen those Facebook posts with our eyes looking out at where everyone else has failed. I don't see a whole lot of people on Facebook saying, I have not been praying for Afghanistan as much as I should have been praying for Afghanistan. I have not been willing to go out and serve on the mission field to people like the Afghani people. I have not seen people on Facebook praying that, Lord, would you please teach me to read and understand how these people think so that when I engage them and encounter them. I have a, a, a response to them that shows the truth of God. I don't see people praying on the internet talking about the fact that they didn't engage with their neighbors who, who were from the Islamic faith. 
I don't see Facebook posts like that. I see Facebook posts like our president failed us. Or our military leaders didn't stand up to the president and his, his entourage like they should have. You don't have any control over that directly. But you do have control over what you can do. Ask the Lord, where am I weak? How have I failed? How can I do the commission you have been commissioning all of us since the time of the church to do better? That's the first thing we can do. The second thing that we can do is for those who are mourning, we can mourn with them. There is real sorrow in the people who are there. There is real sorrow in the people that have lost loved ones. And there is real sorrow for those who, like me, have had what they thought they were doing stripped of meaning. Mourn with those who mourn. But don't pander or use the grief of people for your own political advantage or for your own gain. Don't start making up, you know, Operation Enduring Freedom, remember Afghan bracelets and selling them at a, you know, a big profit so that you can get rich or something stupid like that. Don't take the faces of those 13 fallen, 11 Marines, one Navy corpsman, and one Army soldier who have died and put it on your self-righteous Facebook post. Those families are really grieving for their lost loved one. They don't need you to try to make yourself feel better or your point more stronger by engaging with the grief of that family. If you have done that, you ought to repent. Take that down. Go back to step one. Pray for where you are weak. Remember the living. Care for them. All of them. That includes the Taliban fighters, the Al-Qaeda warriors, the ones who are posting crazy things on the internet. The refugee that has no home has left everything that they've known for the past 20 years. One veteran kills himself by suicide on average every 22 minutes. I am not a prophet, but I believe that time frame is going to go down and it's going to become significantly higher for the next few months because of what we saw happen August the 15th. Remember the living, care for them. Take responsibility for how you shape our government. We live in a very unique country. We know what Christian values are. There is no political candidate who, who walks on water and turns it into wine as they're going along, but there are things that matter more than others. You have a responsibility to vote responsibly. Don't just jump on board whatever political party you think has been best served by you. Figure out what people actually stand for. Not what the political environment is, and that's what they're going to, to move in that direction because that's the way the wind is blowing right now. But what do they actually believe as their central character? And does that align with Scripture? Because if you're voting for people that are advertising, they're going to put in place immoral, unchristian laws and policies, you share in the blood guilt of that to whatever degree God justly says is true because you get to vote for them. Take that responsibility heavily. This should be something you pray over for hours and hours and hours. It should be something you research for hours and hours and hours. 
And finally, what else can you can do? You can learn to be evangelistic to Muslim people. You know, gone are the days where everybody in the United States had basically the same worldview. They basically all believed there was a God. They basically all believed that some form of Christianity was true. And, you know, what we were doing is we were basically going out and trying to convince them to, to you know, make that commitment to Christ. But they, they already fundamentally thought that that's how the world worked. Gone are those days. Uh, Dr. Timothy Tennant has written five guidelines to, to assist us in, in how we can learn to evangelize uh, Muslim people. His first tip is to build genuine relationships. Because the worldview gap is so large, because there is so much baggage in the Muslim community against Christianity, that the, the, you know, the days of just street preaching or handing out a tract, you're not even speaking the same language. If a Muslim person asks you, do you believe in the Trinity, and you say yes, their understanding of what the Trinity is is different from what you think it is. And you don't know they don't think the same thing you do. In their mind, the Trinity is we're saying God the Father had a physical relationship with Mary and produced a biological child who was then made a prophet of God. And because he was such a good, sinless prophet of God that when he died, he got to go to heaven and be a co-heir with God, but he's not actually divine. And the Spirit of God is just a, a, a powerful angel like Gabriel. And so when you say, yes, I believe in the Trinity to a Muslim, their understanding is radically different than ours. And so if you just hand out a you know, tract or a quick piece of paper or have a brief contact, you're not going to overcome this communication barrier. And think about this. I had to go to Al Jazeera Network to find an unbiased, impartial report because there wasn't a news station based in the United States or Britain that wasn't representing one policy from the left or the right. If that's true of our trusted news anchors. How much do you think your neighbor who doesn't know you other than you've got a little Ichthus Jesus sticker on the back of your car is going to trust you without an actual relationship? They're going to write you off as fake news faster than they can throw that tract in the trash. Step, tip two, learn to ask thought-provoking questions. Pen you really have a personal relationship with Allah? They can't. They don't believe Allah has personal personality. That all revelation was given for kind of the hope that mankind individually might be, you know, redeemed. Do you, second question, thought-provoking, think that dying as a martyr on the battlefield is the same morally as a suicide bomb. See, if you understood point number three, read and learn the Quran, if you, if you knew what that said, you would know that the Quran speaks negatively of people who actively commit suicide, who you know, push their own button. But for those who die as martyrs on the battlefield, it elevates them. So what we see happening is actually directly contrary to their own Koran. Learn what it says. Learn what it says because when you can quote back the Quran to a Muslim friend of yours and they say, how do you know so much about Islam and yet you're still a Christian? You can say, because I have a God of peace who knows me and loves me, and wants the best for me, sent his own son to die for me on a cross so that I don't have to pay for my sin. And I've looked at what the Quran says, and it's empty and devoid of meaning. And I actually know what it says. How many times have you kids been told by your parents, quit playing that video game or whatever it is, and they have 
no idea what the actual content of that game is. Quit listening to that music. And they have no idea what the lyrics to that music are. I mean, be honest, a lot, right? And what do you think? You don't even know what you're talking about, mom and dad, because you don't play that game and you don't listen to that music. That's human nature. Do you really want that to be the obstacle to evangelizing your Muslim friend because you didn't take the time to learn what they actually read and believed? Here, here's this New Testament. Go read that, but I'm not going to bother to read what you believe. You're just wrong. Read, believe what I believe. Right? That works. Not. Learn to present what we believe candidly, openly, and with love. Not as a, a criticism to what they believe, but positively stating what it is we believe and why. Pray with your Muslim friends. When we began this sermon, I put up the two flags of Afghanistan, the one on the top left. I don't know if you remember it. It was the white one with all the scribbles on it. That is the first pillar of Islam. I can't remember the Islamic name, Shahada Ra or something. But what it is is a statement, a confession of faith. There is only one God and Muhammad is his prophet. I didn't put it up there because I think that's true. It just happens to be their flag. That's the first of five pillars of Islam. There's another pillar called ritual prayer. And think about this. If you are willing to have more than one friend with you to pray, and Jesus has promised whenever two or more are gathered in my name, I am there you are bringing your Muslim friend before the very presence of a living, personal God. You know, you don't have to be like wicked smart to do these things. The power is in the Word. of. There's no more self-authenticating book than the Word of God. There's no book you read that it reads you back besides the Scripture. So if you pray, if you present our faith candidly, if you're willing to learn what they understand and be able to respond to that in a loving, compassionate way, asking thought-provoking questions on a relationship that has been developed that's genuine and not artificial, you're not trying to win them over, but you're loving them as we have been told to do to our enemies, you are living out what the command of the King of kings and the Lord of lords has given to us. So as the praise team comes back up, I want to just go before the Lord in prayer about some of these things we've talked about today. I know it wasn't a lot of jokes and a fun sermon today. It's a very difficult topic for me to talk about and to present. But it is so important. The souls of millions and millions of people have been given to us to evangelize, to make disciples of. Yes, it's really terrible what happens and what's going on in the political fleshly world, but what happens for eternity is so much more important. We can't let our anger about what happened stop us from doing the work God has given us to do. We can't write people off that God has not written off. That's a hard bullet to bite. It really is, but we know who our king is. We know what his command is. We know who the real enemy is. It's not them. We know what our weapons are the Word of God, and we know we can pray and go before the Lord as a co-heir with Christ, boldly entering into His throne room. So would you join me in doing that now? Father, it is a hard, emotional, 
toil that we know you identify with, that, that your son walked on this earth, tempted in every way we're tempted, that he faced enemies worse than ours who took his very life. Lord, I ask that this truth would be written onto our hearts, would be seared into our brain, that we would be willing to do the hard work that you have commissioned us to, knowing that it's by your power that we are carried along. Father, I ask for a spirit of love for our enemies, not of vengeance, not of bloodthirst, to pervade every Christian God-fearing community that confesses you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray for the repentance of those who are, are pursuing a false god, Lord, Lord, I thank you for the, the millions that are ready right now to hear your word that you have prepared in their hearts to, to hear your word that your spirit has uh, convicted. And I ask, Lord, that each of us would be willing to, to wield that sword of your word for the eternal glory of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Please stand with us as we uh, finish up the service today with amazing grace. My chains are gone.
Amém.